Hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. So we'll talk about chickens, we'll know, learn more about their mental life, and we will also, with a panel afterwards, learn more about uh, the realities of their life uh, here in Canada and elsewhere. So first we will, I will introduce Laurie Marino. She will speak for about, I think, like 40 minutes or so. Then we'll have a couple of question and, uh, question, questions and then after a panel. So Laurie Marino, <laughs> she's been introduced three times today. <laughs> Let's do it again. She is a neuroscientist who worked on the evolution of brain, of the brain and intelligence uh, in dolphins and whales, and in comparison to primates. Uh, in 2001, she co-authored a groundbreaking study of uh, mirror self-recognition in bottlenose dolphins. After which she decided against further research on, uh, with captive animals. So she's an exceptional example of how scientists can be a, a force for good for animals in the world. Her, her research led her to recognize dolphins as persons, and this made her question the ethics of uh, captivity, and of course, the ethics of her own research. That takes some courage. Uh, now she is using her knowledge and skills to set up sanctuary for dolphins and whales in the US, and she also launched the Someone Project, uh, focusing on farm animals, and this is what she will talk about today. She will focus on chicken, but she also has one on uh, cows and one on pigs. Uh, after her talk, we'll have a couple of questions, and then we'll have a panel, including Abby McQuaid. From, she's an animal rights activist for, uh, with the World Wild uh, Save Movement. Uh, also, Rihanna uh, Topan. Am I saying it right? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, a campaign manager for farm animal welfare at uh, Humane Society International Canada. And also we'll have Catherine Ehrman. She's from Germany. She's a veterinarian spe specialized in animal welfare, ethics and law with a special focus on the three R's, the, three, the replacement, uh, reduc the three R's in animal research. You know, we talked about it today enough. So, and she has a forthcoming, uh, uh, forthcoming book, which sounds amazing, on animal experimentation, working toward a paradigm change. It will come out this year in uh, 2018. So this will be the panel later, and let's welcome Laurie. Hi, everyone. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces from this afternoon. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about chickens. And I want to start off, and let me see if I can do this and talk at the same time, if I'm as intelligent as a chicken. Okay, so I want you to meet June. June is someone who uh, was brought to Farm Sanctuary uh, a few years ago. She came with her brood from New York City uh, as part of a cockfighting bust. Um, and June was known to be very, very protective of all the chicks in that whole cockfighting ring. She would try to protect those that were hers as well as those who were not hers. Um, and she seemed to show an indication of having some kind of a fundamental capacity for empathy with others. So, on the right, you see her uh, at Farm Sanctuary, and what she would do for months after coming there, even though she was safe, is if anybody came in the barn, she would run, gather up her chicks, and put them under her, um, and then actually uh, ruffle up her feathers and try to protect them. And this would happen repeatedly. Um, and the point of the story is that um, this, this individual never forgot the abuse of human beings and the pain of separation, and that affected her life from there on in, even though she was in a very safe environment. Sometimes the trauma of what happens in abusive situations uh, doesn't go away even when you're in sanctuary. So today, I want to talk about a few things. One is our public perceptions of domesticated chickens. Um, what, who, 
who domesticated chickens are in terms of their evolution and domestication, very brief. I'm going to talk about the Semon Project, which is what this study is part of. I'm going to then talk about what we've learned about chickens in comparative perspective and summarize and then talk about the inconvenient implications of what we've learned about chickens or what we have admitted to ourselves that they are capable of. So let's talk about public perceptions of chickens. There's a lot of psychological, social psychological literature um, showing that uh, people really don't know who chickens are, right? So if you see photos of chickens in trees, people go nuts and, oh my god, isn't that interesting and fascinating and shocking um, to see a bird in a tree. <laughs> um, but it tells you something about who we think chickens are. And the fact is, is that we really don't even view them as birds. And a lot of psychological work has been done asking people to rate the birdness of various species of birds. And chickens always come out very, very low on that. Um, usually someone like the robin comes out on top. And in this particular study by Boster, uh, the chicken was number 48. Um, so people don't even think of them as birds, which is already a problem because it shows we don't know who they are. And they are also perceived as less intelligent than other animals. So not only do we recognize, not recognize their birdness, but we don't recognize their intelligence. Um, in this study, people were asked to rate the, the perceived intelligence of a variety of species from 1 to 30. Um, and they gave each species a cognitive index ratings based upon people's uh, responses. And of course, we're number one. And the second was chimpanzees. And then you have to sort of go down the line to find the chicken at number 20 um, in between turtles and snakes. And not too far from this fellow, the cockroach. Um, and what it shows is that people do not think of chickens as being among the most intelligent of, of beings. They're typically rated well below other uh, vertebrates, uh, other mammals, and nowhere, other uh, birds, and nowhere near um, mammals. But, you know, anyone who looks at this can see that this is simply a replication of an old mythology that we carry around with us in 2018 called the Scala Natura, right? This notion that, you know, life on this planet is, is, sits on a scale from kind of dumb to and less valuable to really smart and more valuable. And of course, we put ourselves on top. Um, but when you look at this, there's the higher, lower issue, which it doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, really correlate with anything that we know about biology. So chickens are, you know, way down um, on this scale. And the fact is, is that we tend to treat animals who we consider more intelligent better, or value them more than those we don't. And so. You know, things that we would never fathom to do to our dogs or our other animals that we think of as really brilliant animals like dolphins, we routinely do to chickens because we just don't see them as having the cognitive, psychological wherewithal that some of these other animals have. And so there's a tremendous amount of social psychological literature on this um, and this is kind of our starting point. The outcome of all this, as you'll hear more about this from others, is this kind of thing. 
factory farming, uh, all, all kinds of things, a complete commoditization of their lives. Um, and it's not only the outcome, it's the cause. It becomes circular because if you eat them, you are emotionally invested in making sure that you don't know about their sentience, their intelligence, their emotions, because um, that makes it inconvenient, that makes it uncomfortable for you. So this becomes this kind of circular thing uh, where we don't want to know, and that causes more objectification and commoditization, and it all um, sort of reinforces itself. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Someone Project before I get into some of the things we've learned about chickens. The Someone Project was started by uh, Farm Sanctuary, and it's a joint uh, project with the Camella Center. And um, the, the mission of this project is to really change views about who farmed animals are from our present view, which is of objects, co commodities, resources, to the individuals that they are, the individuals with actual lives to lead. And I say farmed animals because there's no such biological category as a farm animal. What we've done is we have taken all of the scientific literature on who farmed animals are and put that all together in peer-reviewed re peer -reviewed, uh, summaries and sort of said to ourselves, okay, what do we know about chickens? What do we know about pigs? Not from what so-and-so says they do or this or that, but what do we actually know? And then let's put that together as a starting point, a peer-reviewed paper, okay? So we've done that. And we've also created white papers um, based on those peer-reviewed papers. Because if nothing else, if you're going to advocate for a particular animal, you better know who it is you're advocating for, right? Um, our goal with the Someone Project is acceptance of farmed animals as real animals um, with a psychology, an evolutionary history, and a stake in their own well-being. Um, here are our peer-reviewed papers to date. We've done um, a review of pigs, chickens, cows, and we're currently working on one for sheep. And here are three white papers that we have produced with Farm Sanctuary based upon those peer-reviewed papers. We have one on thinking pigs, one on thinking chickens, and one on thinking cows. And what's important to know is that these are sort of the more digestible form of the peer-reviewed scientific papers, and they've got all kinds of fun photos in them, colorful, beautiful, but there's nothing in these that isn't in the peer-reviewed studies, the peer-reviewed papers. And that's really important because, as I mentioned earlier, if we really want to know who we're advocating for, we need to know what, uh, what the data say. And I, again, I talked about the fact that um, I've had arguments, vociferous arguments, with people uh, at conferences who claim that, for instance, their chicken recognizes herself in a mirror. And they don't, they don't. Um, and, and it's important to say that because that's part of who they are as well. So they don't have to, to be doing you know, physics to be animals that warrant our respect and, and protection. Some people think you know, that's the case, that they have to be as smart, oh, my pig's as smart as my uncle John, you know, and no. But that's okay, <laughs> you know? Maybe a pig, um, pigs are as smart as us. You don't have to go to the extremes of saying, you know, making things up about animals that aren't necessarily empirically based because these are three brilliant animals all on their own. 
What we've been learning from the Someone Project is that there is valid scientific evidence for complex, cutting-edge cognitive, emotional, and social abilities in farmed animals. So the science tells us this. So with that said, let me just introduce you to becoming the domestic chicken. The chicken is Gallus gallus domesticus. The chicken evolved from the red jungle fowl, and the red jungle fowl is still around. And they basically are the same species, um, but they uh, are considered different breeds. And we have a number of different breeds that are considered layer breeds, broiler breeds, game breeds, all referring to ways that we use these animals. And a few just general facts about chickens and their life history. They naturally live about 10, maybe 15 years. They're gregarious. They live in flocks like other birds. They establish social hierarchies we know as pecking orders. They have a kind of harem type courtship and mating society. They're Personality has a lot to do with where they are in the pecking order. So it's not who's bigger or who's stronger, but personality is correlated with social dominance. They take about 21 days to hatch. And yes, hens do attend to their chicks. They care about what happens to their chicks, and we'll talk about that. So let's get right into it. Chickens in comparative perspective. And I say this in comparative perspective because if nothing else, if we could get the scientific community to admit that chickens are actual real animals with an evolutionary history who can be studied and compared along with other animals who we don't eat, that would be a gain. Just a start is to see them differently. Um, it turns out that when you do that, chickens share many cutting edge cognitive capacities with mammals, including primates. And I want to ask you a question and I want you to keep in your mind all during this discussion is, how much of our interpretation of the scientific findings on chicken intelligence is biased by the fact that we know they are chickens? And I'm not the first person to think about this. Here's a quote from Dr. Chris Evans, who studies chicken cognition. Uh, and this is, this is what he says. And I think this is pretty much the bottom line here, right? He says, as a trick at conferences, I sometimes list chickens, their attributes, without mentioning that they're chickens. And people think I'm talking about monkeys. Okay? That tells you something. That tells you that there may be an inherent bias in how we interpret the findings on chickens. And I will show you some examples of that. So let's get into some of the things that we found through combing through the scientific literature. First of all, we want to talk about reasoning and logical inference because those are capacities that we often consider to be part and parcel of intelligence. Whatever intelligence is, if you can reason through and problem solve and if you can make an inference about something, that's kind of intelligent. Now, we know that a number of different species have the capacity to do things like this. Obviously, all kinds of primates, dogs, um, birds, rodents, have the ability to make an inference about something. And the question is, is any of this evidence, um, do, do we have any of this kind of evidence for chickens? And the answer is yes. So here's one example. Um, it turns out that hens show self-control. Why is that important? Because in order to show self-control, you have to have a sense of self of some kind, right? If I, if I say, don't you touch that, 
and you, you, you need to be aware of your own behavior and actions and control them in order to comply with that. Well, this might seem like a, a simple little study, and in some sense it is, but it gives you an idea. Um, hens were put in a situation where um, they could wait for two seconds and then get three seconds of food. Or they could wait six seconds and get 22 seconds of food, which is like the jackpot, right? It's like telling a kid, you know, you're going to get you know, one jelly bean versus a whole box of Oreos or something, right? So any rational being is going to, first of all, be able to discriminate between these two and rationalize that the best way to optimize reward is to pick the, uh, the condition where you wait a little longer for a lot more food. Um, and, but in order to do that, you have to employ self-control. Um, and chickens do this. Hens do this. They basically hold out for the bigger reward. And these are kinds of tests that we give human children to find out things about their impulsivity and their, their rationality and, and self-control. And it is related in many other species to the question of anticipa anticipation of the future. So this is one example of chickens showing a capacity that you know, we make a big deal about when human children and primates and other mammals show it. Well, let's talk about social learning. Now, this is a big thing because this is about learning information by observing others. And the mechanisms behind this can be quite varied, deferred imitation, emulation. Um, but what's important is that it's the basis of cultural transmission. You can't have culture without social learning. And it's also related to self-assessment and self-awareness. And we know that many primate species and many, many animals uh, show social learning. I talked about that in dolphins. And a few years ago, um, there was a big, giant brouhaha when um, an Italian group showed that octopuses were capable of social learning. So that they don't have to actually do something. They can watch another octopus do something and learn about that task. So that's pretty um, sophisticated. And the question is, what about chickens? OK, yeah, that's it. So we know now that chickens are capable of social learning. They're capable of inference. And they're capable of applying that information to self-assessment. Now let's think about this, right? Inference, transitive inference, is a kind of deductive reasoning. It allows you to figure out your relationship to someone by just observing that other person's relationship to someone else that you know. If, here's the simple example, if B is greater than C and C is greater than D, then B's got to be greater than D, right? That's transitive inference. Um, and it's actually a milestone in human cognitive development. We see it in primates, mammals, other birds. And it turns out that chickens, when you probe what they do to develop their social dominance, are capable of transitive inference. And not only that, but they use that to determine their own place in the social dominance hierarchy. OK? So when chickens observe the interactions of someone who they know about with a stranger, they infer their own status based upon that interaction. So it is like uh, this individual looking at these two um, and saying, well, if this stranger can dominate Henrietta, and Henrietta can dominate me, 
then there's no way I'm going to take on the stranger. The inference is that the stranger could, is, is dominant to me. Um, she doesn't have to get in there and fight the stranger. She's inferring that from known relationships. And, and that's a pretty sophisticated thing to do. And she's also learning something that she's just observing. She's not actually getting in there and finding out for herself. Referential communication. OK, this is fun. It's fun because years ago, everyone went crazy about this. When I was in graduate school studying comparative psychology, um, Two primatologists, Cheney and Seyforth, came out with this book, 1990, How Monkeys See the World. And everyone was carrying on, do other animals have referential communication? Yes, they do. No, they don't. What does it mean? Referential communication is special or important to people, at least scientists who have nothing better to do, than uh, by understanding that if an animal gives a call that refers to something that's referential communication and they have a sense of meaning, that that call means something. That's a lot like semanticity in human language. Um, it also means that there's a mental representation. And Cheney and Seyfarth were the first to show a non-human species uh, engages in referential communication, the vervet monkey, with their alarm calls. And they also showed that referential communication is just, is intentional exchange of information. This is really important because people used to think that animals only made sounds that were like emotional outburst or, you know, they didn't have any meaning in the real world. And referential communication showed that that is absolutely not the case. And we see a number of species here who have throughout the year shown referential communication. Well, let's look at the chickens. When you see chickens grazing, what do we hear? We hear buck, 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 cluck, 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 cluck. That's what we hear. Um, that's not what they're doing. They actually have a very interesting and rich vocal repertoire of at least 24 different sounds, and at least four of these are referential, what the monkeys are doing. And there are food calls and alarm calls. And here's the thing. They take their vocalizations to another level. So here we get into chicken's Machiavellian intelligence, OK? So hold on, folks, because this is not just a bunch of chickens pecking around in the garden. This stuff going on, intrigue, deception, counter-deception, you wouldn't believe it. But you know, you will believe it, because all you have to do is probe. All you have to do is ask the question and say, what happens if I do this? Oh, that happens. And then you find out something. So I'm going to fold in another incredible capacity, perspective taking and tactical deception. Because again, um, when I was going to school, um, this was all the rage. And Witten and Byrne came out with their Machiavellian intelligence book in 1988. And then Franz in 1989, Chimpanzee Politics. And everyone went wild. You know, oh my god, look at all the stuff that's going on, the deception, the counter strategies. They're so smart. Oh my god, you know, social politics, the whole thing. Um, and it, it really is something, right? Because you have to be able to take the perspective of another and manipulate that perspective. That's why it's called Machiavellian intelligence. And it's related to theory of mind, self-awareness, deception, empathy and was first discovered in monkeys and chimpanzees. But now we know a lot of other animals engage in this, including pigs, domestic pigs. And yeah, that's a whole other story. These guys, they mean business, OK? Well, let's take a look at chickens. So we're going to look at that in the context of their alarm calls. 
And we're going to look at things like risk compensation, audience effects, and manipulative tactics, OK? So here's some of the things we know about what happens when roosters use alarm calls. They see an aerial predator like a hawk, and they let out a call that says, I see a hawk. But it goes beyond that. They employ a variety of tactics. Um, some of these include calling only in the presence of a female, OK? Um, and that's interesting, because that is audience effects. They don't just automatically blurt out, ah, you know, hawk. They're thinking, what do I get from this? If it's a female who, you know, I could mate with or who has my chicks, then, you know, I'm going to take the risk. Otherwise, why would I take the risk? Now, it, with intermale competition, it's really interesting. The roosters actually vary the composition and duration of their long calls so that it is difficult for the predator to localize their source, um, but still alert their mate. Um, so they, they find ways of alerting their mate, um, but may not uh, call as loudly. Now, here's, here's a good one. They are more likely to make an alarm call when they are close to a refuge, like a bush that they can hide under, right? Um, uh, or more likely to call in response to a rival's call when they have refuge. And this makes perfect sense, right? It, again, this is just not an emotional outburst. They're considering, if I make this call, it's risky because the predator might find me. But it, it is less risky if I have a place to hide. And so we see a correlation between those behaviors. And this is a great one. Dominant males produce longer calls when a subordinate male is nearby. And, and that is likely because it gives the predator more than one target. It gives them um, a confusing target. So, um, and and it, it provides a way for them to take the chance that maybe the predator will take the subordinate male instead of the dominant one. Females also use calls in this way. They respond differently to aerial and terrestrial predators, which is something we saw in, we see in vervet monkeys from the original studies. They will more, they will only alarm call if they have chicks to protect, which makes sense. And when they hear the aerial alarm call, they crouch down and sleek their feathers down. And that's important because it shows that they understand the meaning of that aerial alarm call because they are responding appropriately. If somebody's above you trying to eat you, you want to crouch down and get real low. That's not an appropriate strategy for a ground predator, but it is for an aerial predator, and they respond appropriately. Let's look at food calls. Now, here's where we get into real Machiavellian intelligence, perspective taking, audience effects, manipulation, and counter manipulation. And I put the chimpanzees up here because, you know, you think this is a chimp group foraging, but actually what's going on in their heads, I mean, again, all kinds of deceptive strategies and counter strategies. And we know that now from the work of many primatologists including folks like Franz Duval, and we're not surprised anymore about that. We just thought that chimpanzees are always scheming. Well, yeah, but what about these guys? It's just a bunch of hens um, pecking around the grass, right? Well, there's a lot more going on. When males find a really delectable food source, um, they do something called a tidbitting display. Um, they make some sounds, and they do a rhythmic dance, and they carry on. And the display is loud, and it's their own unique expression. Um, and what this does is impress the females, um, who think that he's a good provider because he found delectable food, because he's saying he found delectable food. Um, and they're more likely to mate with males who put on more extravagant displays. 
Um, but males develop competitive strategies and counter strategies. So if a dominant male, for instance, hears a subordinate giving a food call, he runs over there, he could run over there and displace the subordinate and pretend that he was the one making the call all along. And therefore, the hen will be impressed with him and he kicks the other guy out of the way, displaces him. And in turn, subordinates who note that dominant males are around, they limit the tidbitting display to just the movement part, omitting the vocals. So if you want somebody to understand you, but you don't want somebody else to know, if you want somebody to understand you and you don't want else, somebody else to know, you pantomime or you just, you just do the hand signals without the, the loud, and that's exactly what they do. Um, they basically, and only the subordinates do that because they know they will be displaced by the dominance. Dominants don't have to do that. But the subordinates, if they want to get any, have any luck with the ladies, um, they're going to have to come up with some real interesting uh, strategies, and that's one of them. Um, of course, when the dominant males are distracted by something else, the subordinate adds back in the vocals, right? So they're watching everything that's going on, and they're acting appropriately. Now, here's my favorite. The rooster who cried wolf too many times. It's like the boy who cried wolf, right? Um, so roosters will sometimes vocalize as if they have discovered food, but they actually haven't. Um, but they are pretending. Um, and they do this because they can attract hens um, and keep them away from the other males. And so that's a pretty good strategy, right? I'll just do the tidbitting display, carry on, boast. All the ladies will love that. And, and they do, initially, but at some point, they become wise to him, and they eventually stop responding, because, oh, that's so-and-so over there. He's always pretending he never really has anything to offer. Um, so they stop uh, responding to him. They're on to him. And, you know, you could characterize this behavior as simple, you know, the hens have learned that this stimulus, this particular rooster, doesn't deliver, you know, and they've, their behavior has been extinguished, if you want to think of it from an operant conditioning point of view. But the point is here is that if, if I were talking about this in chimpanzees, um, you would think to yourself, well, okay, here is this boastful chimpanzee, and the ladies are learning that, you know, he's all filled with air. Um, and I think the answer to when you see these kinds of things is it's not one or the other, it's a combination of all kinds of things. And it's not to say that chickens and chimpanzees are exactly the same, or, or chickens and robins are exactly the same. But we're talking about behaviors that are very surprising to a number of people in chickens and that appear to be behaviors that we shouldn't be seeing in chickens because they're not monkeys and apes. Um, if we look at things like, and I know I, time, if we look at things like emotion, there is a persistent belief that chickens don't experience emotions and that they don't have attachments. That's absolutely false. There are a number of compelling findings showing that chickens experience emotions. We can measure their emotions. And not only that, but we can show that um, in time perception studies, they show emotional agitation or anticipation of a future event. So if they learn that a certain sound after a 15 second delay is gonna be followed by a little squirt from a water gun, when they hear that sound afterwards, they're gonna start getting agitated. Um, also, uh, when they make a positive choice about something like nesting location or where, what they eat, they show physiological signs of arousal. And for chickens, uh, arousal is increased head temperature, um, what's called emotional fever. A 
And here's an example of emotional contagion and empathy. We talked about this today in other kinds of animals. Empathy is the experiencing of a similar emotional state to another. Emotional contagion uh, has been considered and still is considered a very basic form of empathy. Okay, so emotional contagion is when you start to feel and experience the emotions of others. You get caught up in it. And we see this in sports arenas, uh, at theaters and the movies, you know, all kinds of uh, comedy clubs, right? Um, and you get caught up in the emotion. And that is, appears to be a, a, at least a prerequisite or a very basic form of empathy. Well, here's an example in hens. They were... Um, acquainted with three conditions. One is having somebody put a puff of air into their cage. Another is having their chicks, watching their chicks inside a separate cage receive an air puff. And another in which an air puff was aimed outside both cages. So when they received an air puff, they didn't respond at all because it's not really a big deal. Um, but when they saw that their chicks were uh, getting air puffs, they became highly emotionally distressed. Their heart rates and blood pressures increased. They stood alert and called out to their chicks. Um, in follow-up studies, it showed that the hen's responses were not mediated by the hen's, the chick's vocalizations. Um, and basically what they were doing is using their familiarity with what it would feel like to get a puff of air um, and inferring something about what that feels like if, if you're one of her chicks. And the people that did this study concluded that these studies show that hens possess at least one of the essential underpinning attributes of empathy, the ability to be affected by and share the emotional state of another. So it's certainly not true that hens don't care about what happens to their babies, they do. So in summary, chickens demonstrate self-control, self-assessment, have the capacity to reason and infer things in the social hierarchy, social learning. They perceive time intervals. They anticipate future events. They experience complex negative and positive emotions. They exhibit emotional contagion and some evidence for empathy. And I didn't talk about it, but in the book, in the uh, uh, paper I do, that they have very distinct personalities that follow the same structure that human personalities have. So what are the implications of this? Well, I think it's pretty clear the implications are twofold on two levels, one for ethics and one for science. From an ethical point of view, obviously, um, not that it should matter what, whether a, an animal does transitive inference or not, but we really have to consider the fact that they are so badly mistreated um, because we, we don't think they care about what happens to them. So there's ethical implications for how we treat them and their rights. There's also scientific ex implications for understanding of the depths of psychological continuity across animals, that we may be all very, very, very similar and all on a continuum. And you've heard that before um, in a number of ways uh, today. So I just want to thank you for a very brief journey through what we found about chickens. And uh, I'd like you to think about all those things um, as we talk about and show just, you know, what the implications are of our misperceptions of chickens and the mismatch between how we treat chickens and who chickens are. So thank you. If anyone has a question uh, for Laurie, we could take a couple of questions before uh, moving on to the panel. So, uh, 
Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Hi. It was an amazing presentation, and your presentation about dolphins too. Um, I was wondering, are you thinking to include fish, fishes in the Someone project? Can, can you repeat that? I'm uh, sorry. Fishes? Fish? Fish. In the Someone project? Is it include? Yes. Or have you thinking about include them? The question is whether we've included fishes mm -hmm. as farmed animals in the Someone project. Yes, mm -hmm. we have. I didn't do that work. That was done by a gentleman named Coulomb Brown, who's a scientist in Australia. He's a fish expert, and mm -hmm. he wrote a paper um, where he just came out and said, look, scientifically, this is what we know about who fishes are, and this is what it means ethically. And that came out in a major peer-reviewed paper. I think it was Animal Cognition. Or, so that's part of the Someone Project. I, I wasn't involved with that, but certainly the case. Okay, thank yes. you. Hi, thanks for talking. That's really great. Um, as you were talking about um, deceptive behavior and um, uh, a lot of the signs of sort of like flexible behavior in the chickens, yeah. I, I couldn't help but think to myself, I couldn't help but go through the motions of trying to find competing kind of associative explanations for these things. Or could, could, could they be, you know, uh, things that were maybe selected for by evolution, or maybe they're, you know, very, things that could be easily explained by 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 stupid learning processes? And mm -hmm. um, then I then I thought to myself, well, <clears throat> you know, of course you can always run through the gamut, and if your explanation is baroque enough, you can you can say that okay, it's they're not really doing something like logical inference. They're not really um, trying to deceive uh, others. They're just associating mm -hmm. this very complex cue with some kind of behavior or something. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very general methodological question, but I sort of wonder, um, I'm sure you have thought, because I'm assuming you have thoughts about this, where do you set the bar? When does a, when does a stupid learning process become too baroque? That's a great question. It's like, you, if you can explain a behavior at a simpler level, then really you needn't go any further, a lot of people will say. And I think, I think there is no bar. And I think what we have to begin to recognize is that, yeah, there's, there's continuity in psychology. Learning processes aren't stupid, right? But they may not involve all of the layers of insight that um, are involved in, in, in other behaviors. And I guess what I'm saying here is that, um, again, I think that you know, when you look at human behavior and chimpanzee behavior, a lot of it is, is stupid learning processes, and a lot of it is also very insightful, you know, self-reflective types of stuff. Um, the fact that we see these kinds of behaviors in chickens doesn't tell you as much about um, the mechanisms behind it as much as um, the fact that, you know, we don't, uh, that they are very different individuals or de very different beings from who we think they are. And whether, you know, and I think even in human beings, I think Larry Young talked about this too, is that even in love, right? You know, there's been studies that showed that you love someone, you like the smell of their t-shirt or something when they're, you know, I mean, things like that. We think we have all of these lofty types of uh, reasons for doing what we do and that other animals, oh, it's all based on smell or something, you know, but I, I don't think, I think we just need to look at the behavior and just start to realize that we may see very similar behaviors in very different animals. And the way we interpret them, a lot of it has to do with what we think that animal should be doing or not doing. That was, that's my point. That if I showed this in chimpanzees, um, that question wouldn't arise. Because I show it in chickens, the question does arise. It's a good question. Um, but we need to just accept that these, this is their behavior um, and that it may indicate 
a level of psychological complexity that uh, we, we're not prepared to really uh, allow them to have yeah, in that, some sense. Yeah, that, that's really, it's really helpful, thanks, to think of that as maybe, maybe it doesn't matter what the underlying um, le yeah. learning process is. The behavior is such that might, maybe gives us a reason to care about their well-being anyway. Well, I just have to say this, that, you know, you, you have to look at the whole corpus of findings, right? So if there was like one thing that chickens did that was, you know, amazing, and everything else they did was pretty easy to explain by just stimulus response, then you could say, well, you know, maybe that amazing thing isn't so amazing. But in every arena, they show such complex psychological complexity that tells you that there might be a basis there. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Laurie. Sure. Um, I read that uh, some people use the Myers-Briggs personality test with horses, and I was quite impressed by that because there are 16 different patterns, and it's it's a complex complex test. Uh, are you aware of any paper that was written on that, or if it's been used with other species at all? Well, I know you know. I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of any with Myers-Briggs. But obviously, a lot of work has been done on personality and other species. And the personality factors tend to map one on top of the other. Um, there may be three, there may be five, there may be six, there may be four. But we see the same factors across species, which is very interesting. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll invite the, all the panelists to uh, come on the front. Oh, some of, you, some of you have a, a presentation first, hey? Oh. So maybe we can, uh, which, one, after, which one after. do you want to go before? After. You I will go, go first one? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we can sit there so we'll be able to listen to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Lori, for that really, really insightful presentation. And thank you to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Rihanna Topan, and I'm a campaign manager with Humane Society International in Canada, and I work on farm animal welfare issues. So I'm just wondering, quick show of hands, does anyone know of Humane Society International uh, before today? Okay. A couple of you, or a few of you, that's great. So just so you know, we're an international animal protection organization. Uh, we have offices in many different countries, and basically we work on trying to address cruelty to animals in any shape and form. So whether it's companion animals or wildlife or farm anim farmed animals, we um, do our best to advocate for better protections for them. And so what I'm here to talk to you about today is about the lives that chickens have on a factory farm in North America. And I think it's obviously important to consider the way that we treat them in light of what we just learned about how intelligent and how, um, how uh, sentient they are. So uh, I just wanted to mention, I do have some images that are a little bit graphic, potentially a little bit disturbing. Um, so if you do need to avert your eyes or step outside for a moment, of course, please feel free to do so. But uh, I hope you can sit through the whole presentation. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to work. Yeah, did you have to do something different? This one? No. This one? That one, thank you. And that's the red dot. Thanks. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> when we think about the way that chickens are treated, I think it's important for us to think about just how many of them there are. Um, so there are currently about 24 million laying hens in Canada that are used for egg production, and there are 710 million chickens that were killed last year for their meat. And it's important to consider that within the wider context of the number of animals that we raise in general for food in this country. Um, so last year in 2017, we killed about 800 million animals for their food, or for, for, for our food, um, and 90% of those were chickens. So when we talk about the welfare of a farmed animal, I think it's really important for us to consider how a chicken lives because they constitute the vast majority of the animals that we have on our factory farms. <laughs> there we go, well, oh, sorry. So um, some of you may be familiar with what a battery cage is. Uh, this is what an egg production facility looks like. So there are laying hens, as I mentioned, 24 million of them, uh, that are kept in cages like this. And they're called battery cages because of the way that they're stacked. But as you can see, they're very densely crowded. And they're packed so tightly together that the birds within them, the chickens within them, can't even extend their wings fully. They can't move around. They can't do any of the things that they would in nature. 
And obviously this is a very cruel system. It's very bad from a welfare perspective. The birds can't exercise, they can't perch in on some sort of elevated surface like they would in the wild. They can't dust bathe, they can't forage for their food. They really can't do very much. Um, and they can't, because they can't exercise, and because of the way that they're treated, they don't live a very long time. Um, they can suffer from you know, infections, illnesses, disease, um, pecking at each other because they don't have anything else to do. And so even though we know that you know, a chicken can live for 10 to 15 years in the wild, as we just heard, on an egg production, or in an egg production facility, they typically only live for about a year before they're pulled off of their production because that's when their egg uh, production starts to decline and then they're slaughtered for food. So if they don't die in the facilities where they're kept, then they have a very unnaturally short life anyway, and they become spent hens or spent fowl uh, and are processed for their meat. And there's another big issue, a uh, welfare issue within egg production. So it's something that a lot of people don't think about, it, but once you do think about it, it seems uh, quite obvious that obviously in egg production, you only need the female uh, chickens, the ones that are hens and the ones that can lay eggs. And because there are differences in the way that we breed uh, egg chickens versus meat chickens, the male chickens can't be used for meat. And so what happens to them instead? Shortly after they are hatched, they are um, divided based on their sex by workers, um, and then they are dumped live into a macerator, which grinds them up while they are still alive. So obviously this is a horrible thing to happen, um, and I think if you ask anybody when they see a chick, that's not what they think would happen, and that's not what they want to happen. So those are some of the big issues within egg production, but most of the chickens, as I mentioned, are the chickens that we raise for meat. And there are a number of welfare problems here. So first of all, they are selectively bred to grow very large very quickly so that we can get as much meat from them as possible. So as you can see, in the last 60 years or so, there's been a drastic change in how quickly these birds grow. Uh, and of course, there are welfare problems with this, right? They put on so much fat and so much tissue so quickly that their bones and their bodies can't support the extra weight. So they end up with things like fractured bones or broken bones. They end up with lung problems, respiratory problems, heart problems. Sometimes it's so bad that they're, it's even fatal. And so as you can see, um, you know, here's an example of a chicken in the wild that is healthy. It's moving around unencumbered. It's walking. Um, it doesn't seem to have any difficulty moving about. But if you look at a chicken in a factory farming system, they start to walk like this. And so there's something called a gait score, which is what we assign to a bird based on how well it can move uh, from a range of one to five, and five being the worst, one being the best. So what we're seeing is an, an increasing number of chickens that fall within the gait scores of three, four, or five. So that's a three, it's, it's struggling a little bit to walk, it can still move around fairly well. A four is where you can really start to see that the bird is struggling to walk. And so you can only imagine the sort of pain that it's in and the sort of things that are happening inside if it can barely even move without uh, difficulty. Oh. And finally, you can see in gate five if it uh, is loading properly. Um, this bird can barely move. And we're seeing an increasing number of chickens that are, these are called broiler chickens because they're bred for their meat, um, that barely can move at all. And they end up spending a large portion of their time just on the floor, not exercising. So it means their bones are getting even weaker. Their bodies are having a really hard time keeping up with all of the weight that they're developing. And to make matters worse, they end up spending a lot of time just sitting in their litter, which is soaked with ammonia from the birds that they're sharing their environment with, so they end up developing burns on the underside of their body just from this prolonged ammonia exposure. Obviously, this is a horrible way to live. Then you have to consider the fact that they live in very crowded spaces. So chickens that we raise for meat in this country are not kept in cages, but even though they end up having a lot of space when they're babies, when they're chicks, by the time they reach their slaughter weight, which by the way happens at about five to six weeks, significantly shorter than they would live in the wild, um, the barns tend to look like this. So each bird has on average less space than that of a square letter size sheet of paper. 
So obviously this makes it harder for them to move around, even if they were feeling up to it, for them to exercise, engage in any sort of the natural behaviors that you would see in the wild. And then you have to look at the fact that there's nothing for them to do all day. So if you look at a barn like this, which is pretty typical in North America, you can see that there is literally nothing for them to do. There's nowhere for them to explore, nothing for them to play with, nothing for them to exercise on. And that's important because if you're in your natural environment, you have things to explore, things to forage in, or things to perch on. Uh, and here, there's no incentive for them to move, which further compounds the physical issues they're already having, not to mention that there's no mental stimulation. And then, of course, there's transport. So some of you might have heard about this. It's been in the news a lot in the past few years. And um, Abby, who's going to speak after me, will talk a bit more about it in detail. But some of you might have seen transport trucks. Anyone raise your hands if you've seen some chickens uh, in a big truck on the highway or something? Yeah, we see it all the time. And they're usually driving a pretty long distance. And the startling fact is that in Canada, it's perfectly legal for a truckload of chickens like this to be on the road for up to 36 hours without any break for the birds, without any food or any water, and in any sort of weather. So currently, our regulations say that that's perfectly legal. You don't have to protect these birds from the coldest days of winter, the hottest days of the summer, and you don't have to give them anything to eat or drink along the way. So as you can imagine, not only is that highly uncomfortable, but what you end up seeing is birds that are suffering from heat exhaustion or dehydration or frostbite, and many of them don't even survive their journey because of these terrible conditions. And this is just a bit of a closer picture to show you how tightly they can be crammed, as you might have seen in some of uh, the trucks that you've already witnessed in your day-to-day -day lives. And then finally, I wanted to talk a bit about how they're slaughtered. So, after enduring what is no doubt a very stressful journey to get to wherever their you know, processing facility is, these birds are brought to slaughter. And so what happens is these transport trucks come into a facility, the crates are offloaded, the birds are either dumped live onto a conveyor belt or pulled out of the crates by workers who are working very quickly, and they're shackled onto a slaughter line that looks like this. And as you can see, they're suspended by their legs, which is very painful for them because they've as I mentioned, been, grown to, uh, been bred to grow so quickly that their breasts and their uh, bodies grow to be exponentially uh, larger than the rest of you know, their, their, uh, sorry, their muscles and their uh, bones and that kind of thing. So it's putting a lot of pressure on their legs, so much so that it's very common for bones to be broken or actually amputated because there's just so much weight on these birds' legs. And this is a very stressful experience. Obviously, these birds don't know where they are. They're in pain. They're uncomfortable. They're being handled very roughly, usually, um, so much so that they end up thrashing around quite a bit. And so what's supposed to happen is they're supposed to be dragged through a bath of water that is electrified that should render them unconscious. What happens most of the time, though, is they're not unconscious. They end up maybe being paralyzed, or they end up missing the bath entirely because they're thrashing around so much. And so what happens is they approach the blade that is supposed to kill, kill them by slitting their throat and they're either still conscious or, again, because they're moving around so much, they miss the kill blade, and there's sometimes actually a backup killer that has to be there to physically, manually kill the birds that miss the blade because it's so common. Uh, or if they don't have that, the birds will continue on to a scalding tank, which is just what it sounds like, a large vat of boiling water um, that is supposed to make it easy for their feathers to be removed. But if the bird hasn't actually been killed by that point, they will either drown or burn to death. And so you end up with some birds that look like this. They're called red birds in the industry. And obviously, I mean, I just can't imagine what that would be, feel like to go through that as um, the end of my very sad and, and unhappy life. Um, and it's bad from an economic perspective too. I mean, this isn't good for anybody, so I, it baffles me why it happens, because if you would think, at least in the industry that is profiting off of this, this bird can't even be used for food, so it's just a bad situation all around. And then the last thing I wanted to mention too is just about on-farm practices. So you might hear sometimes about barn fires that happen in Canada, and they're surprisingly common, sadly, because our regulations currently don't consider farm buildings to be regular buildings because they have a low human occupancy. And so the requirements for safety measures for fire prevention are vastly different from those of a regular building. So there's no requirement currently for farms to have you know, sprinkler systems that are industrial grade or industrial grade smoke detectors or any sort of fire evacuation plan or uh, any protocols like that because they're, you know, because basically we treat animals like property in these situations. So these birds 
well, you'll often see headlines of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of them burning to death in a barn that went up in flames because once a barn catches fire, it's extremely difficult to put it out. And uh, this is, a, again, an important welfare consideration. Now, there is uh, talk that the National Farm Building Code, which governs the regulations for fire safety in farms, will be updated in the next few years, but everything I've heard is that it won't be uh, updated to include any additional protections for animals. And so I just wanted to end by talking a little bit about what you can do if this upsets you, as I <laughs> think it should. Um, we advocate for the three R's, which I think it sounds like you've already uh, talked a bit about today. So for us, that means reducing your consumption of animal products or replacing them in your diet with alternatives that don't harm chickens. Um, so, you know, there's tons of great options out there. Um, natural substitutes for eggs and things like baking with like chia seeds and flax seeds and that kind of thing. Um, there's great egg replacer products out there and there's great chicken replacement products out there that don't mean that you have to hurt any animals. Um, but if you do decide to continue purchasing animal products, then we'd advocate for the third R, which is refinement. So, you know, there are options out there for higher welfare systems. They're not perfect all the time, but they are certainly an improvement. So things like cage-free eggs or free-range free eggs uh, or meat that is certified humane is at least an improvement over the, some of the practices that I just talked about. And then there's other things you can do too. So obviously it's great that you're all here to learn about some of the issues in factory farming for chickens today. Um, you can engage in conversations with your family, friends, colleagues, whatnot. Um, obviously you can write about it and, and uh, what you're doing if you're here for research. Getting involved with an organization that already does something is great. Um, and then of course you can vote your con or voice your concerns in a few different ways. So you can vote based on, you know, uh, politicians or parties that have some sort of animal welfare platform or consideration or pledge to do something that is better for animals like chickens. Um, and uh, you can talk to your MP or your MPP about this because they do have, uh, they do want to hear from your constituents, you know, about concerns like this and this may not be something that they're aware of. And then finally, a lot of what I do is engaging with corporations to help them adopt higher welfare standards. And so if you do shop at a grocery store like a Metro or a Provigo or whatnot, and you talk to somebody there and tell them that you'd like to see them source chickens that are more, uh, that are raised in better welfare conditions, that's something that they listen to. And then when I go to speak to somebody in their like corporate sustainability uh, department, they will have already been hearing this from their customers and they'll be more likely to look at making changes in their own supply chain that are going to be better for the animals. So that's it for me. My email's up there if you'd like to contact me after this, but I will be available for questions, I guess, yes. now? No. Okay, sorry, afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? All right. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Abby McQuaig, and I am here um, just to give you a little bit of context and some uh, imagery and videos that gives an idea of what's really happening to these animals, kind of as um, Lori and Rihanna discussed. Um, basically, I everything you're going to see here is... Oh. Maybe not. I'll use this. Um, so everything you're going to see here is 100% Canadian content filmed by either myself or you'll see someone, um, someone's name up there as well. Um, but it's all from frontline activists. This is common practice. Nothing you're going to see here is illegal. Um, nothing you're going to see here is anything other than like standard industry practice. Um, so everything is filmed with footage working with the SAVE movement. If you haven't heard of it before, the SAVE movement is a global love-based animal rights organization. Mm 
Cool. Try this now. Um, so what we do is we go to these places of injustice. We go to the slaughterhouses and to the farms and we document and we give the moments, uh, the animals a moment of love before they're sent into slaughter. Um, and we use social media to share their stories so that other people can help make, can make the connection between what's on their plate and the living, breathing, sentient beings that we are looking at. Um, I do want to give a bit of a warning because the, some of the content that I'm about to show could be considered graphic and it may make you uncomfortable. Um, nothing that I'm going to show you is um, during the slaughter. There's no gore. There's no blood. Um, but that being said, it probably will strike a chord with you that this is something your actions or your beliefs don't really support. And uh, that's kind of the point of what we do is to get you to question those decisions instead of just going along with them. Um, so yeah, take it for what you will. Um, most of what I'm going to show you is documented from uh, my work with the SAVE movement in London, Ontario. That's where I'm from. And so this image comes from Cargill Meats in London, which is a huge um, chicken slaughterhouse. They kill upwards of 80 to 100,000 individuals every single day. Um, and yeah, like when we, talk, when we think about the fact that there's 700 million animals killed in Canada every year, or chickens killed in Canada every year, um, these huge numbers are really hard to conceptualize when we're thinking of like the individuals, but that's the purpose of the work that I do and that our groups do is really to get you to come closer to see the individuals as individuals, as not as obscure numbers, and to make the connection that they are living, breathing, and worthy of their own lives. Um, so each of these animals is an individual. Each of them is experiencing this for the first time. Um, they're all about 40 days old, as mentioned, and really relatively like babies. So I'm going to show you a quick clip here just of kind of the work we do. So you can take a few minutes with the animals and see what their kind of last moments are like, what their experience is like as they're arriving at the slaughterhouse. As you can see here, this is just the truck that's pulling in. We take two minutes with the animals, and you'll see. So as you can see, as Rihanna described, they're very, very cramped and crowded in these cages and they don't have a lot of room to move, can be trained, transport for up to 36 hours. There's often a lot of feces from the above crates dripping down onto the ones on the bottom. It's a horrific experience. Um, as mentioned, they're killed at 40 days old when they're grown for meat. Um, over uh, 700,000 or 700 million of the 800 million animals that we killed for last year were chickens. And that number does not actually include the number of chick, uh, male chicks that are ground up in hatcheries. Um, government stats show that over 1.59 million animals arrive dead at slaughterhouses each year. And this is completely fine with the industry. They have no problem with this. This is considered humane and standard and completely appropriate. Um, this is a photo of one of the rescue hens that we took in a couple years ago. Her name was Skye. She's a victim of the egg industry as well. Um, all this Rihanna covered, so I'm just kind of glancing over it. Uh, so yeah, the largest chicken slaughterhouse in North America is actually located in Brampton, Ontario, where they kill over half a million birds every single day. Um, this is also the only certified slaughterhouse uh, in Ontario and the surrounding area that is able to kill these spent hens. Um, they get them for nothing and are using them for their meat, and they often arrive in worse conditions than Sky looks here. 
Um, this is just, again, covering the kind of like mobility issues um, and what their bodies are going through in the 40 days leading up to their slaughter. As you can see, these are the same ones. Um, this is an example of inside one of these facilities as they're um, being raised to be killed. Um, so what we see on the front lines at the slaughterhouses, we see a lot of injuries arriving. We see literally severed limbs. We see um, animals who are dying from heat exhaustion in the summer. We see animals who are frozen to death in the winter. Um, yeah, common injuries are broken limbs and feet due to the extremely quick loading process. Catchers in the early mornings when they're loading up the trucks will just grab three to six chickens at a time by the feet and throw them into the crates. Um, and then when they are removed from the crates at the slaughterhouse, they are roughly hung up and dragged out of the crates as well. So often if their feet get stuck in between these little holes in the crates, the workers will just rip them directly from their body while they're alive. Um, in every single truck we see these kind of feet. We see uh, limbs discarded kind of like as waste waiting to be cleaned at the end of the day. So this is one example of like a respiratory issue that we see with chickens arriving at the slaughterhouse. Um, again, this, this slaughterhouse is Cargill. It's a huge corporation worldwide. They are responsible for 5% of the total animal agricultural emissions. Um, this is the best that money can buy. This is grade A. This is the highest standard of slaughter that we can kind of do in today's world. Um, and every single chicken McNugget in Canada actually comes from this one slaughterhouse. So if you've ever eaten a chicken McNugget, you've eaten someone like this. Here we have just another example of some common injuries. There's blood dripping from this baby's chest um, from a wound somewhere under her feathers. And another dead on arrival, which is very, very common. Um, Here's another photo of a dead baby um, taken by my friend Samantha at London Chicken Save. And another one, and her body unfortunately was so squished against the side that other birds were piled on top of her. And so, some of the birds when they arrive at the slaughterhouse are completely defeated based on the conditions that they've gone through. They seem to have kind of given up on life and are very non-responsive. Others are literally fighting until their final moments, such as this one. And so we are unable to touch the trucks because there's a police presence and a security every time we're there. So all we could do, unfortunately, was just film and share her story. So, oh, in the winter, there are a lot more concerns for chickens because they are quite fragile. Um, it's very common for us to be out there bearing witness when it's like minus 20 degrees, and the only thing that the chickens have separating them from the cold for 36 hours while they're going 100 kilometers an hour on the highway are these tarps. They're the same material that you would get for like a camping tarp that will keep the rain off of your tent, but they will in no way keep you warm. Um, oops. And so often in the winter, we see almost entire truckloads of chickens that have been frozen to death. There are a lot of uh, animal cruelty cases in Canada, especially in Brampton, Toronto, where these birds have been like mass amounts, tens of thousands of birds at a time are freezing to death. And then there are instances like that happened quite recently, which give us an opportunity to shed a little bit more light on the industry. Um, in April of this year, there was a truck that was on its way to the slaughterhouse. This was about two kilometers away from its final destination. Um, when it took a turn too quickly and dropped about 20 or so crates full of animals into the ditch. And as you can kind of see, there was fresh rainwater from the day before. So most of the animals actually died by drowning. Um, they, the, a lot of them died on impact but most had to be retrieved from the ditch um, and put into a discard pile, which was then taken back to the slaughterhouse and incinerated. 
we were notified, our local activist group was notified based on someone just driving by who happened to see this, and they tagged us on Instagram <laughs> and said, we don't know what to do. And they just said that there was dozens of crates open, dozens of dead bodies on the ground. And so within a few minutes, we were there, and we were able to save, we were able to take five to get medical care. And only one of them um, survived. And so this is Sapphire. This is about five days after the accident. Um, healing remarkably well, actually. But the amount of injuries that these birds sustained during the crash was quite ridic like, absolutely ridiculous. She had two fractures on her wing, which is why you can see the uh, little bandage there. Her foot had been fractured as well, so she couldn't walk on it properly, adding to her mobility issues due to her weight. And she had a huge gash across her chest that needed stitches. And uh, when, when I picked her up at the at the crash site, her blood was oozing so much from it, we actually had thought that she'd be the least likely to survive, but she ended up being a little bit of a miracle chicken. Oops. Well, and so now Sapphire has her own social media, in case you want to follow along and learn a little bit about her personality, because when chickens are given the opportunity to not be in confinement and, and actually live in a natural state, they, their natural personalities come out more and we can learn a little bit more about them. So this is one of Sapphire's first moments on grass when she had her bandages removed and was given the okay by the doctor to start walking around a little bit more. And she's very curious. She's a very friendly, social animal. When we first kind of picked her up and found her, she was very reserved and very hesitant and calm, and now she's quite vocal and quite social. Um, and yeah, so just her story helps other people to make the connection too between the, uh, the, the food that they eat and the living, breathing beings. And I just have a couple of quotes up here to, again, add some food for thought to this whole discussion. Do you eat chicken because you are familiar with the scientific literature on them and have decided that their suffering doesn't matter? Or do you do it because it tastes good? I think a lot of people would honestly answer the question that they do it because it tastes good, because it's convenient, and they think that uh, it's just the norm. Um, but in fact, it's not necessary to consume chickens at all. Chickens, whether intelligent or stupid, individual or identical, are sentient beings. They feel pain and experience fear. This in itself is enough to make it wrong to cause them pain and suffering. So what I've learned from my work in the animal rights community and by bearing witness to animals day in, day out as they arrive at slaughter is that these animals are not defined by how we perceive them. Our perceptions are a bit of a bias in itself. Um, just because we don't understand the personalities that they're communicating with and, and that they're living with and the way that they experience the world doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, Given the chance at a natural life and not used for their bodies and exploited, chickens are friendly, social, and complex individuals. And uh, I kind of just wanted to give Sapphire the final words. So as you can see, she's very social. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's basically it. Um, if you have any questions, obviously I'll be here to answer. And if you want to get involved locally, uh, Montreal does have an animal rights uh, group called, with the Save Movement called Montreal Animal Save. So you can reach out to them on Facebook or contact thesavemovement.org to find out how you can get involved as well. Thank you.
maybe I start because I didn't really say much. Um, I'm a veterinarian and um, there are not too many veterinary speakers here, so maybe <laughs> I start with that. So, um, yeah, I totally um, agree that we have to change something. The question is how, because I don't think the industry is impressed by the data and I, yeah, it's actually also, yeah, it's, we've known that for a long time, but it's good that you put it together and, you know, it, um, what, for my personal experience with chickens, um, I can just say I became a mother of, of a one-day-old chicken that we rescued from some kids in Barcelona because they had uh, stolen um, the, chicken, the chick from, from their mother, mother that was in the like, free-ranging. It, it escaped uh, from humans. And it was amazing to see the bond uh, we developed. And then I took the chick back to Berlin, actually, from Barcelona, and on the airplane, uh, she was just sitting uh, here in my scarf. And actually, I was in a Spanish um, airplane, otherwise that wouldn't have been legal. <laughs> the German ones wouldn't have allowed that. And people all came up to me and were totally fascinated. And it was kind of interesting to see, see that, because then I also brought her on the train, and we went to the place where she ended up with a friend of mine on a beautiful farm um, near Berlin. And people all came to me and said, oh my god, that's amazing. And, and I said, yeah, that's what you normally eat. Uh, she's someone you would uh, eat. So I think that was, yeah, it made people aware of who those animals are. So it was amazing. So I don't know, maybe we should have more chickens as um, companion animals. Maybe that would help uh, to improve the situation. So yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add something about your, you, you talked about the three R's and applied it to, uh, to our food industry. I, I think it, 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 it's a great idea. I think I, I've heard it a couple of times, but I, I'm not so sure about refinement. We have a lot of trouble within the scientific community with this famous R. I, I don't think that refinement uh, would be an option, even a reduction. I mean, we are not going toward less and less uh, uh, animals being king, ki killed for our food. It's more and more. For the foreseeable future, what you just witnessed will be, uh, the, the aura will just go on and on and there will be more and more animals killed. According to the FAO, the, uh, there will be uh, uh, more like 50 to 70 percent more uh, meat uh, that will be eaten in, by 2050 compared to today. And most of them are, are, are actually birds. They, they are chickens, be, precisely because you have also all this uh, idea that uh, this uh, meat is more uh, environmental friendly. So you have this argument that, oh, you don't have all the methane, methane, the metha methane that you have with the cows. Um, yeah, obviously they are not a they are not a threatened species, so most convert conservationists would not care about them. Uh, so I think that when we are looking at the situation, we are looking at what, what we just heard today. We can agree that this is profoundly unjust, that we have a duty to stop that. But we can, and we know that it will not be stopped in, in, the, in, the, in the near, near future. And I, I don't think that we all face with this situation. I don't think that we only have a duty to be vegan and to stop eating animals. I think that we have a duty to help these animals. And what you are doing with the safe movement is amazing, precisely because uh, it gets to, uh, to the, 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 the important thing of being there, opposing this situation. I'm sure, I, I agree that through education and uh, uh, consciousness raising, we can do a lot of, of good. But at one, at one uh, uh, one day we will have to, in, in Montreal we do have that, if you want to go to, slaughter, to a slaughterhouse uh, for birds, it, every week uh, Terrien, l'association Terrien organize uh, this at the Abattoir Marvide. Uh, I really encourage you to come see the chicken, but also you will feel a strong moral outrage and you will probably become someone like me <laughs> who think that actually we have, it's, it's completely unjust, it's pure horror. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have a, a comment, and I actually have a question for uh, uh, Dr. Herman. Uh, the comment is not, the comment is just a comment. We, uh, we today, this same day, 
we gave a moderately hard time to some of the to scientists that work with, with animals, but I want to point out now two huge differences between what you just saw this evening and the kinds of things that are being done to voles, for example, which are horrible and shouldn't be done. But what we saw here, a half a million chickens treated like that and killed that way. Half a million? Yeah. Is that at what you Brampton, said? At the one slaughterhouse oh, yeah. in Brampton, there's Brampton, half a million a day. Half a million. It's monstrous. It's unspeakable. And what? And as as the questions I think that Abby asked at the at the, uh, at the end attest, it's just because you like the taste. It's not to save lives. It's not because of autism. It's not because of um, uh, psycho psychopathy or schizophrenia or cancer. That's appalling. My question to uh, Dr. Herman is, your profession, who, wh what are the people that are, I assume that they're veterinarians uh, associated with these breederies, who are they? We asked who the chickens are, who are these veterinarians? That's a very good question. Um, when I went to vet school, I had a hard time surviving there, actually, to be honest. Um, I, yeah, it, you, you basically get, they teach you how to exploit certain animals, so-called farmed animals, and how to better lives of pets, so-called pets. I don't even like the term pets because, yeah. Um, yeah, that's what you learn. And I just remember I had, uh, so for your final exams, you would uh, have, depending, you would by, by coincidence pick a species, and I had uh, pigs. So I had to talk, um, I had to uh, internal medicine pigs, and I had the exam, and then the professor was very impressed with my diagnosis and whatever, and he asked me, do you, if I want to specialize in, 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 pig, uh, in pigs, pig medicine, and I said to him, never, ever, because this is, um, you do management of those, you don't do individual treatment of pigs or chickens, this is all, it's, it's called herd management. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it's the opposite of what I wanted to do, so I, I, I yeah, but it's, it's, I don't know, I think that most uh, vet students get brainwashed. Um, they might start vet school with bad, uh, good intentions, but they, they get desensitized. There are actually studies uh, showing that, that um, when you ask them about the use of analgesia, for example, um, analgesics, um, in their first year of vet school, they are more, like they are more pro um, pain management than at the end of their vet school. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the whole education is doing that uh, to those uh, people. But the thing is, it's also, if you see the industry, I mean, they are part of the industry of animal ex exploitation, most of them. I'm not talking about everybody. There are, diff there are other vets, as you know yourself, you know vets that, um, who really care about animals. Um, yeah, but in general, it's, we are part of the system of exploitation, um, so that's how we are, we are getting trained. So that's unfortunately what I have to say. But I, I also want to add that um, we actually would have the potential to um, be great advocates for animals, and um, yeah, that's actually my next book project. Um, it's going to feature vegan vets. Um, who work for animals. Um, so what they do for animals, um, how they came to, uh, to become animal advocates and uh, what they are actually doing um, for animals. So that hopefully soon you will be able to read this book because there are other veterinarians out there. So. Uh, je vais poser ma question en français, donc si tu pouvais traduire, ce serait très gentil. Um, Qu'est-ce que vous pensez à date qui a été le plus efficace pour euh, changer euh, la perception des gens quant à la consommation de poulet? Parce que là, vous avez beaucoup euh, mentionné l'intelligence euh, de cette espèce-là et vous avez aussi euh, mentionné leurs conditions euh, misérables un peu. Il y a aussi l'aspect plus santé qui est 
aussi lié à la consommation de protéines animales qui n'a pas été euh, mentionné. Est-ce que des activistes devraient plus encourager quelques méthodes plutôt que des autres? Et aussi, euh, je sais que certains activistes pensent que voudraient qu'on filme les fermes et les abattoirs 24 heures sur 24 et que ces films soient disponibles en ligne, comme ça les gens auraient, euh, verraient dans le fond ce qui se passe avant de, de manger, ça pourrait peut-être diminuer la dissonance cognitive. OK, so let me trans translate that. So, uh, what do you think is the most efficient way uh, to raise consciousness and change behavior, uh, cha raise consciousness about chicken and change the behavior of people? We talked about um, knowing more about their mental life and their social life and their emotions. We talked about knowing more about how they are treated in the industry and their fate and to see and to feel all their suffering. But we didn't touch on health reason. We didn't touch about environmental reason. I guess you want to refer to all the anthropocentric reason, like but we would also benefit from a change in... Our relationship with animals. Yeah, more generally our relationship with animals. And some people, this is like really two questions, and some people are suggesting to put some uh, videos in slaughterhouses and farms in 24 hours. It just has been uh, uh, refused in France uh, like two weeks ago or something like that by the Senate, uh, 24 hours uh, a day. So I guess it's a question. Should we, like, do you, the question is, we, do we think it's a good thing? Ha, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a lot of problem uh, with, with this. Okay, I, I'm not against it. Uh, of course, I'm not against it. Yeah, I, it will prevent me from freezing to death outside of a slaughterhouse to see what's happening inside. So, of course, <laughs> I'm for it. But I, there's also a lot of problem associated with that, uh, that um Uh, that technique, who will like, you know, like uh, videos and live feed in yeah, but, slaughterhouses? Yeah, the idea. Yeah. No, no. The the idea would be to to have them because there might be uh, issues uh, concerning the workers. But that's if they ha are carrying the cameras, you're not going to see the faces of the workers. The yeah, you will see the animals. So so that would protect the, the identity of the workers if that's a problem. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go. That's a good uh, multi-part question. Is this is on right? Yeah. So, uh, so to answer the part about the the video feed and in, in slaughterhouses and that kind of thing. So, I think the issue still is currently though, even if you're wearing the camera, you can see the faces of the other workers. And mm. so, you know, what we're seeing is there are some countries like the UK and France that are looking into mandating this sort of live uh, stream footage from mm. slaughterhouses, which I think is wonderful, and I would love to see here because I think that the more that people realize what goes on behind those walls, the more people will change their habits and their diets and that kind of thing. Um, but what happened even just recently in BC, right, was we had um, footage, or we had uh, issues with uh, an undercover investigation that revealed a lot of cruelty towards chickens, I actually think it was, um, at a BC farm, and so the company's response was, okay, we don't want this to continue happening, so let's look at installing these cameras or having workers have these cameras, but then the privacy commissioner in BC said that that would be a privacy violation, and so they're still determining, I think there's, that conversation is still happening in terms of what we will allow in Canada, and I, I mean, this privacy commissioner's judgment was not legally binding, it's not official or anything, it was just his advice and his opinion, so we're still, I think, waiting to see what's going to happen. I, I mean, our organization, of course, advocates for that, because until, as long as slaughterhouses exist, I think everybody should have the right and, and the knowledge about what happens within them. Um, and then just to answer the other part about what I think is the most effective way to be an advocate for animals, so... I think there's so many avenues, which is nice, but it can be hard to choose one. So I would say, you know, choose what you're passionate about. But for me, like, I try to come at the issue for several, from several different uh, angles within my work. So half of my time is spent promoting the consumption of plant-based foods, for example. So I work with large-scale institutions currently, like universities and colleges, to help them offer more plant-based options on their menus. Because what we're seeing is a lot of people requesting more plant-based foods. Uh, for health reasons, for environmental reasons, for animal welfare reasons, but they don't always have the options available and we know that people will make choices based on what's convenient and what's accessible and what tastes good and what's affordable to them. So the more that we can make those options available, I think that 
if that happens at the same time as people are becoming more aware of all of the reasons why it's better to not eat animals, or at least to limit your consumption if that's where you're starting or where you're at right now, um, then those things will together you know, drive change in the same direction. And then we're also trying to advocate for better legislation for farm animals. So government advocacy is part of it, and you know, talking to your elected representatives or voting for parties that actually consider animal welfare is so important. Uh, and then I also think that you know, we see that the industry is very reluctant to change you know, the agricultural industry has a large stake in keeping things the way that they are for monetary reasons, economic reasons, and for making sure that they can continue selling their products because people don't really know what's happening behind the scenes. So what really drives change, I think, is the large scale consumers of uh, animal products. So I, that's why I try to work with corporations as much as possible. So like the Loblaws, the McDonald's, the Starbucks, the Tim Hortons, the Burger Kings. I mean, I would, I've been plant-based uh, for I'm in my sixth year of, of being completely vegan, so I mean, that's what I would hope for, but um, these corporations that continue to buy large volumes of meat, they are the ones that can dictate to the industry, I want you to change your practices because I buy you know, 10% of your, your products every year. And so what happens in Canada is we have a forum where retailers and restaurants can work with industry to develop guidelines and codes of practice for the way that animals are treated on farms here. And when you have those corporations say, I demand that you, you know, slaughter your chickens more humanely or that you don't grow them this way or that you give them things to do and you give them more space, that is what I see to be more effective. It's, it's not as fast as I would like, but I think it is effective. So I think there's many different options. I'd be happy to talk to you more afterwards if you want to get more involved. Just to add to that a little bit, um, about the video uh, surveillance in slaughterhouses, I personally, as far as where we're at right now and what we're dealing with, I think it's a very, very good idea because, again, more exposure to it is going to open more minds and more hearts and get people to actually realize what they're contributing to and paying for. And that, that alone will start kind of like get this snowball rolling kind of thing. Um, but I, I do think it's a step and not a solution. Um, but then again, when you're talking about what's the best method, like going to the slaughterhouses or, or, or you know, advocating for plant-based food options, I, my answer is just yes. Do the thing that resonates with you. Um, and don't even limit yourself to one thing. Like, yes, I go to slaughterhouses every week, but I also post my food pictures on Instagram and be like, hey, look at this delicious, like, vegan egg that I just made, or something like that. Because there's a lot of different ways to influence people. Sometimes it's not by telling them what's wrong, but it's actually just living as an example. And that way people can follow your footsteps and reach out to I think whatever is calling to you is the thing that you should be focusing on doing. And often it'll be our, our passions and our kind of creativity that will show us which form of advocacy is the best. I, I just wanted to make one statement, and that is I think, I wish it were as simple as saying, you know, glass walls and slaughterhouses and everyone will say, you know, I don't want to participate in this. I don't think that's the case. Um, I wish it were, but I think that we have to consider the fact that if we're talking about this, we're already sensitive to that fact. And, and for us, if seeing a video like that may be very impactful. But the fact is, is that for a majority of people, it's not, and it's not gonna change their behavior. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, doesn't mean anything. Like you said, do everything and, and see, you know, see what works. But I, I, think, um, I think it's a tougher nut than that. I, it's not just a matter of showing people what goes on and they're gonna go away and never eat chicken again the next day. They're gonna be eating chicken um, because there's a lot of psychological mechanisms in place to make sure that you restore yourself to some level of comfort the next time you want to taste something good, like chicken. And I mean, that's just a reality that we have to work with. Uh, we still have uh, less than, uh, like 10 minutes. I just want to add about the slaughterhouse case really fast. In Denmark, uh, it's the, f the only place, to my knowledge, in the world where they have tours of their slaughterhouses, public tours, and you can also watch live footage on YouTube of their, fo of their uh, slaughterhouses. I, en I encourage you to look if you want. I don't think that will make people change their mind. They kill pigs in the CO2 cham chambers, but it, actually you don't have the camera. You, 
in the chamber. You see the, the, when they get, get in and get out. But, okay, uh, I don't think that made people in Denmark st stop eating animals. I just have one question because, uh, because of the freezing of so many animals. I'm just wondering, isn't there, like in, in Germany you have um, state veterinarians who are in the slaughterhouses and they supervise. So if they would see something like that, they, they, those, those people would like the transport, uh, the people who transport those animals uh, would get fined at least. That would be uh, impossible. So I'm wondering what, what is the legislation here? Uh know like what happened there are a lot of cases that we hear about in the news um, like um, I think it was last year at Maple Lodge or Maple Leaf in Toronto um, where uh, upwards of 5,000 animals were frozen to death on a truck and so there was some investigations and we have a, a, a corporation called Animal Justice in Canada who, who is um, advocating for animals on a legal platform and they do a lot of work to bring these things to light I don't actually know what the like the rules are or what the laws are or what happens there but I do know that there is like a, a vet tech at every three slaughter. sessions here are going to be on that. Three sessions, the last three workshops are on that subject. There you go. Okay, good. Sorry. Yes, um, maybe it's because it's legal, but I don't remember having seen images or um, um, journalists uh, doing any um, report on those living conditions. So is it a fair assessment? It's because it's legal, nobody cares, or? I, yeah, I, I think as far, like, as far as like mainstream journalism is concerned, this isn't something a lot of people want to kind of touch on or report on because they usually are associated or affiliated with these industries in one way, way or another. Um, it is pretty standard, like you can come any, any day, any week to a slaughterhouse and you'll see stuff like that. Um, it could be just be that it's the norm and it's so accepted as the norm that we're desensitized to it. Because sometimes you can see headlines, you know, a lady kept 12 cats in her apartment, <laughs> all bad conditions, you know. That's nothing compared to this. Yeah, I think just to add to that, it's, it's partly because it's legal, I'm sure, but also partly just because it's been normalized, right? I mean, we saw so much from Dr. Marino's presentation that we have a very different way of thinking about farmed animals than we do other animals, even though, you know, they're no less intelligent or thinking or feeling or whatnot. But it's this way we've been socialized to think, no, this group of animals, they're for food. I, you know, I'm not supposed to care about how they think or how they feel or what's happening to them. And it's, it's, a, it's a hard process to undo, but, to undo, but I think it's a combination of, yeah, of people not wanting to speak out because they have some sort of tie to the industry and then, and then people just turning a blind eye because they think this is the way it's supposed to be. Also, just, yeah. sorry, one thing is that a lot of what we get as, like, the activists out front of slaughterhouses or online in the, the comment section of these things is that, well, they're just dumb chickens. Why do you care? There's bigger issues to worry about, that kind of thing. So I think it is the, the mentality that we have about chickens that they're just dumb birds who are just here to be killed, and they're just here for our use. Um, and we yeah. kind of, like, block off the rest of thought once we get to that. Mm -hmm. And right. even when we get uh, um, scientific information about animal minds. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, research in human psychology showing that uh, animals as, that we characterize as food animals, uh, as animals to be eaten, we will downplay their, uh, their, their minds. And this, this can be kangaroo, this can be, uh, would depend where you live, which animals are categorized as food. Uh, earlier, uh, Stephen uh, talked about we do that for taste. Uh, I have some doubt about this. The reason we do that, it's not taste. It's social norms. It's habit. We never decided, oh, when we were young, oh, I will eat animals or they taste good. It's not a decision that we have made. It's a decision that uh, previous generations have, have made for us, and we can use critical thinking to change that. And when, when our social norms and habit are, habits are so clearly immoral, that's the role of the law. That's the role of policies to, to, to get in. I mean, you probably know about Richard Dawkins, probably heard about this uh, scientist, and also he's a really a rationalist. And on the other side, you have a, a guy like Jonathan Haidt. We, he's not a rationalist, he's a moral psychologist. Really, he, he really thinks that reason do not play, does not play a, a, an important role in our behaviors. But both of them are basically agree. They, they eat animals. Both of them eat animals. They agree that it's not okay. Uh, Eight says, says that he's uh, be, uh, morally opposed, but not behaviorally opposed to eat animals. And both of them want that 
society to, society to change for them. They don't want to, all the burden to change their habit. They want the society to do it for them. And I really think that we are mistaken when we are looking at the numbers of vegans to know how many people are opposed to eating animals. We, are only, we may be only 3-4% of the population, but when we look at the numbers, it's more than 20-30%, sometimes even 50% of people saying that they are opposed to kill animals for food. So we, we, it's, it's a political question. It's not only a consumer question. And I think also we have to have perspective. You know, again, what you allude to, you know, if we advocate for animals and all our friends are advocates for animals and our colleagues are advocates for animals and all our Facebook people are advocates for animals, we could be lulled into thinking that, woo, everybody's an advocate for animal, everyone agrees, more and more people are eating less and less meat or doing this and that. And once in a while you need a reality check, you know, to say, look, this is, this is my world right? Um, and it's not just step outside this building, you know? Um, and so I think it's important, and I'm not saying I do this especially well either, but yeah, to really do check on, you know, what is actually going on. Um, the number of vegans uh, in society in the United States has not changed in decades. Um, uh, That's not true. Not in Canada. It went up. Oh, okay. But but so just important to deal with the reality and, and sometimes not get lulled into thinking that, oh, things are getting better when they're actually not. Yeah, so we have five minutes, so you can you do it quick so we have the last one too. Uh, so you, you just made the first point, my, my comment suggestion for me. Yes, uh, people who are implicated in these issues do tend to overestimate the degree to which these questions and perspective have penetrated the general population. But the silver lining of that is we may be underestimating the impact of things like this video content because we are overestimating how many people have seen it. Uh, and so I would say much more important than getting more content, although that is important, uh, not just for publication but for legal reasons, this happened at this time, at this place, uh, but more important or at least as important as having more content, is having more display, especially when people get so much information from social media where there are algorithms making sure they don't encounter things they don't want to see. And so things like getting stuff onto mainstream, having independent display platforms, like something as simple as video playback with an LCD screen and a, and a battery pack in a public place so that people who aren't looking for it see it is incredibly important. And I think the more advocacy happens online where there is uh, algorithms that means that uh, you're not randomly disseminating this. A lot of people you want to see this will not see it precisely because they don't want to see it and precisely because the advertisers don't want them to see it because these are mostly commercially owned platforms. Uh, we need to be a lot more strategic about getting the eyeballs connected to the content and not just throwing more content at the people who are intentionally looking for that. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. It's also a good, uh, a real problem with human issues. People don't want to know, people don't want to see. Last question. Thank you. There's a resistance people have to pain. So when I've tried to circulate the videos about what's been going on, they don't enjoy seeing it. So I was sitting there thinking, what else can be done? And it occurred to me what I really like watching is these wonderful videos about cats and dogs and the species getting along. And I was thinking if you could put together beautiful videos about their intelligence. The, ones, the one you showed about the chicken making those sounds I'd never heard a chicken make before. Different things to show how miraculous they can be. And then if everybody in this room got a hold of that and everybody circulated it to 12 people, we can't underestimate the ripple effect that would happen that that would have, right? So that was one thing I, I really wanted to put forth, to come instead of from the head and about injustice, because people feel so overwhelmed, there's so many injustices going around, that to move their heart in a positive direction may be the way to go. So that's one point. The other point was it's got to be, I think, a twofold approach, because on one hand, you, okay, nature abhors a vacuum. 
So you have to have something ready to fill in. So in one hand, you want to steer them away, and you have to keep in mind that you're steering people away from being an unwitting accomplice. And I think if we appeal to people and their sensibility, most people don't like being played. And if they see they're being played and that they are being an unwitting accomplice to this, then they might wake up more. And then, as Rihanna said, to steer them to the positive. So you have both things ready to work in tandem. So I think that showing them that they've been brainwashed is a really important thing that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's only a minute left, so if anyone has another comment they want to add. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's important to try all those methods um, because everybody, as we said before in the summer school, is going to be touched by something else um, or has other priorities in their life. And um, as was also mentioned by one of the participants, health, um, our health is also a point that you can make uh, when it comes to chickens because they are often uh, full of salmonella. And so, for example, one of the issues. Um, and of course, I think in the US they are, they are also in, put in chlorine or something like that. Uh, to Yeah, there are many things that are definitely not healthy for us. So definitely we should um, just see, like try all, there are so many arguments against um, exploiting chickens and other animals and we just have to see, like advocate for, or ex like show all of them and I think uh, that way we will reach people but everybody has their own, um, yeah. Own way. Yeah, own way, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, yeah, I think we can learn a lot about social change when you, in the human case. Uh, what you just said about uh, showing happy animals, like sh showing, because we know in the human case that it doesn't work when you show uh, humans as suffering victims. It doesn't uh, necessarily uh, it, it evoke the right emotions and actions uh, of doing something. But when we, we show, like, really outgroup people and immigrants and people living far away as full-fledged individuals who are able to uh, flourish and live a, a full life, it it motivates people to uh, welcome them home and to uh, care about them. So thank you. Thanks a lot.